Hi, we're going to talk about learning today, which is Chapter 5. As always, we start with our student learning outcomes. You can review those to know um, what, what's important in this chapter. So what is learning? A lot of times when we think about learning, we think about what you might do in, like this in a classroom setting. So going to school, cramming, you know, studying book material. But psychologists call learning any kind of change in behavior or any type of change in your knowledge as a result of what you experience. So it's a lot broader than it is just um, the, the idea of going to a classroom setting. So one way you might learn is if you take um, aspirin when you have a headache and it takes your headache away, in the future you're going to have knowledge that taking a pill of aspirin is going to actually help you feel better. So you've had that experience once, you've learned that that association is there, and when you get a headache again, you're going to be more likely to take aspirin. So learning is any change in behavior or knowledge. It's a very, very broad construct. Conditioning is what psychologists call when you learn um, an association between environmental event and behavioral response. So some kind of event happens, um, you take an aspirin, and then you learn a response from that. You feel better and you're more likely to continue um, taking aspirin in the future. So you have an event happen and a response to that event. We're going to talk about two types of conditioning. The first is classical conditioning, which is an, um, based on automatic behaviors or things that you don't really control. Operant conditioning is what we're going to move into after classical. And with operant conditioning, these are voluntary type behaviors. So you'll see this distinction kind of come out as we cover the material. Um, new behavior, once it's obtained through one of these forms of conditioning, is shaped or maintained over time. Classical conditioning. Many people have heard of Ivan Pavlov and his experiments with the dogs. This video here is great to explain a little bit about what he did, but Pavlov was a physiologist who kind of noticed that these dogs that he was um, working with would salivate before the meat was presented. So he would bring in meat to feed them, but he saw them actually start to salivate prior to the meat coming in. So they were learning something about when the meat would arrive. So there's some really important terms for classical conditioning. You have to read through each of these terms, definitely study them, understand the difference. So condition, we talk about that as kind of being that learning. So an unconditioned stimulus, there's no learning needed for this stimulus. This would be the meat for the dog. So if you present meat to a dog, you don't need to teach them to drool. They're just going to do it. The response that they're going to provide is what they do once we show them or provide for them this unconditioned stimulus. So the unconditioned response is going to be salivation. We're going to move into the conditioned side. So because it's conditioned, we know these were learned. So what Pavlov did was he presented a bell before he presented um, meat. So um, this, this stimulus of the bell was initially neutral. It didn't mean anything to the dogs. Dogs don't care about a bell ringing. It's not important to them. But after repeated pairings of the bell with the dog's meat, the bell, the meat, the bell, the meat, eventually that bell became a conditioned stimulus. So it elicited the conditioned response. So the dogs were then salivating to only the bell. After these repeated pairings of the bell and the meat, the dog learned that when the bell is rung, the meat is going to be presented. So it would salivate at the sound of a bell. So this picture, picture from your book is going to explain how this works. So this is showing Pavlov's actual experiment, the neutral stimulus, um, unconditioned and conditioned stimuli. To put this into a human perspective, a lot of people are confused with this um, classical conditioning and think that it's mostly for animals. But to put it into a human perspective, um, we'll talk about nursing. So when you have a baby, the unconditioned stimulus for them is, um, you know, the breast, milk. They want milk. When they have um, the milk presented, they're going to salivate. So this is an unconditioned response. You don't have to teach a baby that it likes milk or needs milk, and you don't have to teach them to salivate. Many women, though, might put on, before they nurse their baby, may put on a nursing cover like that shown here. So this is a neutral stimul stimulus initially. The baby has no interest in the nursing cover. It's not familiar with the nursing cover. But with repeated pairings of the, um, the nursing cover and the breastfeeding, the nursing cover is going to become a conditioned stimulus. 
So after repeated pairings with the mom wearing the nursing cover, putting the baby to the breast, feeding the baby, eventually, as soon as mom puts on the nursing cover, the baby is going to have the conditioned response of salivating. These are just some funny comics about Pavlov you can read, a couple good videos to explain some of these constructs. Another example to move out of the feeding domain would be something I did. So I used to love this song um, from the Black Eyed Peas uh, about tonight being a good night. Used to love it. So I thought, hey, this is a great song. Why don't I set it as my alarm? You can imagine how this might have gone wrong. So after repeatedly waking up to this song, I no longer liked the song when I, hear, when I heard it out in public just randomly. So even now, if you play this song for me, it started to be associated with a negative feeling of having to wake up. So it ruined the song for me effectively. <laughs> Factors do affect conditioning. So there does need to be conditioned stimulus immediately before the unconditioned stimulus. So if the mother put on the nursing cover and then just pittered around the house cleaning things or checking her email, um, there's a long time delay, the baby wouldn't learn this association as well. There's also a difference between the stimuli that are generalized and those that are discriminated. So in this case, if you've got a mom who wears um, a scarf, so this is a nursing mother, she puts on this scarf, um, the baby may salivate to the scarf. That would be stimulus generalization. So this similar um, stimuli is going to target or trigger a similar response in the baby. So the scarf is triggering the drooling. Or you can have stimulus discrimination. So the baby may instead learn that if the mom puts on a scarf or an, um, an apron or a robe, that none of those stimuli trigger the breastfeeding. None of those are going to be associated with breastfeeding. It's only the nursing cover that is associated with breastfeeding. So the baby's then going to discriminate. They're only going to have the salivating response to the nursing cover, not to the robe or the apron or anything else. So they're going to discriminate between those stimuli. The extinction and recovery. Um, extinction, if you uh, have a learned behavior, but you eventually stop making that association. So if you have a dog who's learned when you ring a bell, it gets meat. But eventually you keep ringing the bell, ringing the bell, ringing the bell, but you never present the meat, you'll see extinction of that behavior. If you give the dog a while and then ring the bell again, they might salivate a little bit saying, hey, you're going to feed me. But once you don't again, then we'll see the extinction. So that graph kind of shows that. Um, definitely read about John Watson in your book. He's very important for the American behaviorism movement, interested in studying um, the scientific study of observable behavior. This was a quote from John Watson, just kind of lets you know what kind of person John Watson was. Um, you may have heard of some of John Watson's most famous work, which was with Little Albert. So with Little Albert, he thought that you could use this classical conditioning procedure to actually condition emotional reactions in humans. So he conditioned this baby, Little, Ra little Albert, to um, fear a white rat. So this graph kind of shows how he did this in the um, unconditioned stimulus, uh, conditioned stimulus, the responses. It'll show each of those, um, those steps of this uh, training protocol, but really he paired the rat with a loud noise. Little Albert didn't like the loud noise. After repeated pairings, he eventually, uh, of the loud noise with the rat, he eventually became afraid or showed fear when shown only the rat. This generalized to being afraid of Watson's beard and of Santa Claus masks and other fuzzy things and um, poor kid. But yeah, this is uh, Watson's most famous experiment. His second career though, um, Watson was a really interesting character. He uh, had an affair with this woman here who's one of his graduate students, Rosalie Rayner. She was also the person who helped him with the little Albert study. Um, this affair was very scandalous at the time. He was removed from his academic position and he actually went into advertising. And he realized that you could pair um, you know, attractive women with products, and after repeated pairings, that we'd start to have a positive association of the products. So if you pair Paris Hilton with a cheeseburger, and you pair them over and over and over and over again, we're gonna learn an association between this product and the cheeseburger, or the cheeseburger and Paris Hilton, or um, sexuality. So he kind of brought us that. Um, so thanks, Watson. Some contemporary view of classical conditioning. We know now there's some cognitive aspects, typically that we look and see if, the, if a signal is reliable before we follow it, so you can kind of review that. Um, also, we look at evolutionary aspects, so we know that if you have something that you eat and it makes you sick, uh, maybe even for an unrelated reason, like you get the flu, 
that many of us will then not eat that again. So we've learned something. It's a taste aversion type of learning. I did that with Fig Newtons. I ate a whole sleeve of Fig Newtons once, then got sick, threw them all up, and now they make me totally nauseous. If you even show me one, I'm like, oh! So <laughs> probably experience that. Operant conditioning. With operant conditioning, we're talking about voluntary behaviors. We're going to talk about reinforcement and punishment. Thorndike you can read about in the book, but generally he um, put cats in a puzzle box and tried to see what they, how they would escape through trial and error. The things the cats did that improved their chances of getting out of the puzzle box, they continued to do. Those that didn't influence their chances of getting out of the puzzle box, they stopped doing. B.F. Skinner built on Thorndike's work. He um, called operants any active behavior that generates a consequence. So if you put a dollar into a vending machine and it doesn't give you anything, but then you shake it and out pops your, um, your Snickers bar, you're going to have a consequence for shaking it that's going to make you more likely to shake it in the future if you're not given your, your Snickers bar. Reinforcement always, always, always increases the likelihood of behavior. This is very, very important that you understand that distinction. Reinforcement is always increasing behavior. Now you can add something to increase the likelihood of behavior. That's positive reinforcement. So if I give you a sticker or a dollar, that's increasing um, to the likelihood of your behavior by positive reinforcement. You could also take something away, which is negative reinforcement. So I could take away your chores to increase the likelihood of your behavior. So positive and negative do not mean good and bad. They mean adding something or taking something away. This um, chart will just kind of explain that difference. So the kind of things you could give or take away to influence behavior, some of these things are going to be primary. So that's things that meet your biological needs like food and water. Others are going to be conditioned. So this is things like money and awards. So we've learned that money buys us our food, so it's a conditioned reinforcer. We've learned that association. Punishment is the other important thing. So we have reinforcement and punishment. Punishment always reduces the likelihood of behavior. So if you're punished, it's going to reduce your behavior. You can um, have a positive punish, punishment where you add something to reduce the likelihood of behavior, such as if you're drinking and driving, I could add prison time, and that's going to reduce the likelihood of you doing that. Or I could take something away. So to reduce drunk driving behavior, I could take away your driving license. This quadrant is going to show how you put in reinforcement and punishment and then the positive and negative to kind of make this uh, these four boxes. So this can kind of help you to conceptualize reinforcement and punishment together. There's some problems with punishment you can review. Shaping is interesting because this is reinforcing um, every step towards a goal behavior. So if I'm trying to teach this dolphin to jump through a hoop, I might give them a little snack every time they get closer to this behavior. So if you approach the hoop, you get a little snack. If you stand up a little bit, you get a snack. If you jump through the hoop, you get a snack. So you're just reinforcing getting closer to that goal. Um, reinforcement can take the, the shape of continuous reinforcement. So every time you do a behavior, you get a treat. Or it can be partial reinforcement. So you only reinforce maybe every fifth time or eighth time that someone admits a behavior. Partial reinforcement is more resistant to extinction. So we know this is the case because people will hold out or animals will hold out hope. So they know, well, you know, I pressed this lever eight times before I was given a treat last time. I've pressed it ten times and no treat, but maybe it's going to be on the next turn. So partial reinforcement actually works be better to maintain behavior. Behavior modification is applying these learning principles to help people. We often see this with children. So this is kind of showing, you know, do this step, then this step, then this step, and um, you get a little reward along the way. Learned helplessness is a very important construct. So what this is saying is that we'll learn in certain situations that we're helpless to make a change, and then even when we could make a change, we don't do it. So they did this with dogs. They had them in a, in a box that was shocking them, and the dogs learned that no matter what they did, they couldn't get out of the shocking box. It was just going to shock them. Then they placed this, those same dogs into another box that they could escape, but the dogs didn't even try to escape. They just sat down and took the shock. So they had learned to be helpless. This is just showing the difference with classical and operant conditioning. With observational learning, we know that people watch and imitate the behavior of others. We learned a lot about that from the Bobo doll experiment, where children were imitating aggressive behavior that they saw with adults beating up a Bobo doll, but they really only imitated that behavior when it was reinforced. Mirror neurons is the final topic, and these are neurons that we now know that we have that are activated not only when we watch 
or when we do it in action, but when we watch somebody else do it. So this really shows that we're wired to learn from watching others. Bye.